what were the inefficiencies displayed by the Crimean War? Just about every inefficiency that you can think of. Um, failure to communicate properly, failure to uh, repeat messages to all who should receive them, uh, failure to write messages in a standard form. I mean, the simplest sort of st staff work, the things you learned in the first few weeks at Staff College, they didn't know how to do it. Has there been any orders? After the Crimean War, there was a general search for improvement in military officers, which led to the reformation of the Staff College. What the foundation, or the reformation of the Staff College did, was to put that uh, uh, on, a, on an organised basis, or at least um, rough out the basis on which it should be put. From its birthplace in the Antelope Inn at High Wycombe, the Staff College moved to a greenfield site at Camberley, in the grounds of the Royal Military College. After submitting his plans to Queen Victoria and the Prince Consort, James Pennethorne's design for the new college building was approved. Pennethorne chose the classical Italian style, Inspired by the setting of a Roman bath, he conceived the design of the entrance hall, which still remains one of the most impressive features of the building today. I think the whole quality of the building is an essential quality of this establishment. It's one of the most magnificent buildings that I've known and to be able to work in as well. And I always get a thrill whenever I come into this building. And I think that uh, that has been the continuous thread which has maintained the character of those who've worked in it and the building itself. I think the building, it, it is a venerable and dusty, if not dusty, I hope, I mean, but of course it, it is a venerable building. It, it's not ideal for its purpose, but uh, the, perhaps no buildings ought to be. It's Parkinson's, one of Parkinson's laws was that perfection of layout is a symptom of decay. The Staff College has never been entirely fitted for its purpose. I mean, uh, you know, Prince Albert forgot to put the bathrooms in. Starting in Camberley in 1862, it was a pioneering college. It was a, a brand new idea, and the officers who came here were a band of brothers. Very small number of them, small number of DS, uh, and it wasn't until the end of the 19th century that it became uh, still a pioneering college, but becoming much more seriously militarily as the curriculum developed. Previously, the curriculum had placed considerable emphasis on subjects such as topography, science, mathematics and astronomy. Many long hours were spent on brush and line drawings and a great deal of time which may have been devoted to tactical work was therefore wasted. The Reverend J.F. Twisden, Professor of Mathematics and Astronomy, epitomised the nature of teaching at the time. He taught at the college between 1858 and 1886. Uninspiring and deeply unpopular, he was a pendant of the old school, whose opinion of the army officer was formed by several years of teaching cadets at the Royal Military College, and it was not a high one. Twisden wrote, It is clear to me that Satan begat the army officer and instilled in him no virtues, only congenital idleness and mischief.
Yes. Don't you think, Mr. Twiston, that you might give the examiner a hint that we're rather a weak lot at mathematics? I don't see the slightest occasion to do so. He'll so soon find out for himself. Whether to placate the Reverend Twisden, or more probably to attract a better kind of officer, the Drag Hunt was formed in 1871. The whole point of a drag hunt was to attract the right sort of officer, to attract the sort of officer who wasn't um, afraid, indeed enjoyed risking his neck in the hunting field, um, and to liven the place up a bit. And so it was made quite clear that the drag hunt was here as part of the, that, that new ethos, and that all officers were expected to hunt. But of course, the drag hunt, as well as making a positive contribution to the life of the college, was occasionally responsible for the odd dark undercurrent. Electing a new master of the drag could be a particularly sensitive time. On Haig's course, he was universally regarded by other students as an aloof thruster who, who didn't bother too much in cultivating relations uh, with other students but concerned himself greatly with cultivating his relations with members of the directing staff and with the commandant of the day. This did not go down terribly well with many of his peers. And one ambition which he had set himself was to become master of the drag. The student body were determined to prevent that happening. And the way they did that was by putting up a, well, Captain Allenby, a, another cavalryman, who would fill the role just as well as Hay and be, and be rather more agreeable personality uh, to, to which to head the hunt with. And so there was a student lobby to prevent this, and Allenby got it. On the outbreak of the South African War, the Staff College gradually petered out and finally closed in April 1900. However, it reopened in November of that same year with 64 students, but with an instructional staff of only six. So began the life of the Staff College in the 20th century. After the death of Queen Victoria, royal interest in the Staff College continued. In 1905, Edward VII made his inaugural visit as monarch. However, it was not events in England that were shaping the atmosphere, but rumblings on the continent. It was the time when the curriculum started becoming much more seriously 
military because the commandant at that time, Rawlinson, Wilson and Robertson, they were all seeing the, th the, the European threat coming up. It was quite clear uh, where the threat was coming from. They couldn't actually mention Germany, but it was clear that it was going to be a serious European war and they redirected the curriculum to field exercises, schemes as they were called, that took place out in the countryside here. They were getting officers used to the idea of planning uh, re reconnoitering operations uh, in, in realistic ways uh, on the maps and, in, and on the ground for the war that they were going to have to fight in, in Central Europe, as people thought. Despite the impending threat of conflict in Europe, students were not to be deterred from pursuing those activities which contributed to the lighter side of life at the Staff College, as depicted in cartoons of the time. In 1910, Robertson saw the need to expand the college, uh, along with the change of the curriculum, to spread the message wider. And he proposed expanding the building by adding the third floor, which gave you 27 more bedrooms, and adding bathrooms in the rear wings, where there'd been staircases up to, up to now. And his proposals were accepted. And he got the funding for it, and the building was done between 1910 and 1913, when he handed over his commandant. So that was a, a very material change, and he wouldn't have got that funding if the government hadn't taken his proposal, which were based on the threat, very seriously. The success Robertson had had with the building was in stark contrast to the start of his tenure as Commandant in 1910, which had been tainted by his dealings with Wilson. He found on his desk a bill for the greenhouse at the Commandant's house. It was only £10.60. 16, 16 shillings or something like that, but there was a lot of money in those days. Robertson was infuriated by this and wrote to Wilson's predecessor, Rawlinson, and asked him if he had sold the greenhouse to Wilson. Rawlinson's reply was unequivocal. Absolutely not. It was built by Lady Rawlinson. You should not pay for it. However, a man who was eventually to rise to the rank of Field Marshal, having joined as a trooper, was not to be deterred by such petty acts of snobbery. Instead, he sought to imbue in the students the same sense of determination that he possessed. You must remember that Robertson was a very tough and formidable man who placed the highest priority on physical fitness in staff officers. Exercises should be made as realistic as possible, and therefore he deliberately set out to make officers tired before they made their appreciations and formulated their plans. Hence these bicycle rides, to make officers tired. In other words, chutes should be something other than beer and skittles. They should be made realistic. Men should feel the stress, the pressure of war.
and it was these students who had been so carefully schooled by Robertson and the other commandants of the period that would face the supreme test of the Great War that began in 1914, even though the start of that war had taken everyone by surprise. It is interesting that as Archduke Franz Ferdinand was being shot in Sarajevo, the Staff College was holding its annual garden party. Nevertheless, a few months later, the Staff College shut and remained closed for the duration of the war. When the course reassembled in 1919, you've only got to, to look at the name boards in the Star College to see the enormous range of decorations that people had. These were the survivors, of course, the ones whose names didn't appear on the war memorials downstairs. And you were looking at a body of comparatively senior, although young officers, mid-30s, large numbers of, of DSOs and MCs, VCs, and a lot of CMGs and CBEs. So these were officers who were returning with the rank of Lieutenant Colonel Major, some captains, but who'd probably been in formation command. So again, you, you were a band of brothers, but they were people who'd been through this appalling experience. And naturally, the Great War had its effect on where the emphasis was placed in the curriculum. I think there would have been a great deal about artillery tactics and artillery doctrine because guns had dominated the First World War and gunners came to dominate the army. One such individual was Lieutenant Colonel Alan Brooke, who later went on to become a field marshal. Seen here at Camberley in 1946, sitting next to the other great field marshal of the Second World War, Montgomery, who attended the Staff College the year after Alan Brooke. Montgomery is a student on the 1920 course, one of the first post-war courses. And in his memoirs and indeed other public lectures, he's very, very critical uh, of the standard of the course. And in this criticism, he's by no means alone, incidentally. The standard of directing staff immediately after the First World War was not very high. And quite frequently, uh, the students had much more experience and knowledge of the matters which they were discussing uh, than, the, than the directing staff. And they were very impatient. For example, I well remember one of the uh, directing staff was known as Silky Wilkie, who was a poseur of the highest order, who would come, come into the syndic room and place a silk handkerchief on the chair before he sat down. He was completely and utterly ignorant of the most recent developments in tactics. But Montgomery himself drew criticism. The owl pie of that year posed a conundrum. If it takes 10 truckloads of 9.2 Mark V star Indian pattern to stop one bath on the second floor of the staff college from leaking, how many hay nets with full echelons and under constructional supervision by Congreve will be required to stop Montgomery babbling at breakfast. Another important figure during a period that was to see much change in the way students were taught was Colonel J.F.C. Fuller, who arrived as a member of the directing staff in 1923. Standing only 5 foot 5 inches tall and bearing a close physical resemblance to Napoleon, he had earned the nickname Boney when here as a student. The major, the major change uh, comes after the First World War with the introduction of the syndicate system. Now, it is, I think, interesting that before 1914, the Staff College is essentially a school, and there are occasionally uh, efforts made to change the name to War School. And many of the complaints in the 1920s was it was just like a school in which the students were fundamentally treated like schoolboys. Now, there is an effort in the 1920s to create an atmosphere which is more akin to that of a university. Now, those who led that, especially the Commandant Ironside uh, and uh, his colonel, 
JFC Fuller, who would, was holding a position comparable to the Director of Studies today, and indeed held that title. Neither of these had been to a university, so they were rather shooting in the dark. But what they wanted to create was something resembling a seminar system, whereby rather than students read papers, students discussed their experience. Whilst progress was being made at the Staff College, the dark spectre of a resurgent and restless Germany was once again looming on the horizon. And so the conquering sons, who had fought with such bravery in the Great War, were again called to arms a mere 20 years later to counter the threat of Hitler's Third Reich. In 1939, exactly the same thing happened. The junior and senior divisions closed down at the same moment in August 1939. And the difference was that the course didn't close. It opened a couple of weeks later with the war courses that went on very much in the normal Camberley spirit, uh, taking people through a four-month war staff duties course, an operational course. Pitt Newton, at 24 and a half, the youngest staff college student this century, describes his war course. Intense course. I mean, there was a war on. We'd been used to working 24 hours a day, seven days a week, if necessary, uh, in the past five eight, five years. And uh, so, what didn't come uh, naturally to be working? We worked Saturday mornings uh, and five and a half days a week. But there were lectures and uh, from outside lecturers and films and other activities in the evenings. I never found the boy action. I enjoyed it. I enjoyed it as much as any other part of my military career. Indeed, I value the fact that instead of being PSC, as we were at that time, we are now PSC, and I got the full dignity of PSC up to my name. The syndicates were syndicates of ten, and there were seven syndicates in each division and three, 210 students all together in three divisions, one of them being at Minley, Minley Manor. I was Minley at the uh, annex at Minley Manor and we shared rooms there. And I shared my room with the Frenchman, Monsieur de Vauguin, who had escaped from occupied France and joined the British Army. He was a, he was a cavalryman, French cavalryman. And we used to be called the two strategists because we delighted in spending our time discussing the strategy of the American Civil War and such like. Exercises in the field were not always greeted with universal enthusiasm. The TWT tactical exercise of our troops, which was irrelevantly interpreted as a tedious exercise without termination. I don't know whether that's still current. And I remember an occasion on a shoot when we had we had a cavalryman in the in the party, and we were in a hopeless situation. There was an open stretch, a wood at the far end occupied by the enemy, with wire, machine guns on the edge of the forest, and no means of ascertaining the size and strength of the enemy, and the DS turned to his officer and said, well, Major Sanson, what, what orders would you give? Oh, he said, I think, sir, so. I will give the order to draw sabers and charge. Time not spent in the syndicate room or in the field was spent attending lectures in the Rawlinson Hall. Oh. 
And so on to the advance by night. In order to keep up relentless pressure on the enemy, it is often necessary to advance by night. Infantry, supported by only a few tanks, should have little difficulty in advancing. Down to the launch and all the most tedious part of the entire course. The next two courses after mine were also six months, and were, of course uh, those officers who couldn't be spared as we were spared because of uh, operational command and commanding battalions and regiments. And so the course 16 and 17, particularly course 16, which was from November 45 for six months, was probably one of the most high-class high courses in, uh, in the experience of the college. One of the members of course number 17 was the then Major David Smiley of the Royal Horse Guards, with wartime experience in the SOE. And when we got there, nearly all the students and the DS, the directing staff, were people who'd fought in the war. They were absolutely all of them, except some of the students were ex-prisoners, had been prisoners of war, and there were some of those on the course as well. And the other point about the course was, I think nearly all of us had to come down a rank. We all got sort of promoted in the war, and I finished the war lieutenant colonel. But as soon as I went back to Staff College, I was a major. And we had no less than three brigadiers who'd been major generals. And one of them, I think his name was Prior Palmer, had actually commanded an armoured division in Europe, in the Battle of Normandy. So we had quite an experienced lot of students. We didn't take things all that seriously. The only people who took things really seriously were the poor chaps who'd been prisoners and who'd missed things. And I don't know why, but I always found that the, the gunners were much more serious than anybody else. They rather irritated us, in fact, because when there was a lecture, they came to any questions at the end. It was always the gunners who asked questions, which meant we had to wait another five minutes while we got the answer from the, whoever it was. Although memories of the Second World War still lingered, a few years after 1945, the Staff College settled down into an existence that we can still recognise today. In effect, it had achieved maturity, and all those elements that had been planted in the early years now began to grow. While there was no major conflict on the scale of the First or Second World Wars during this period, the curriculum was naturally shaped according to the world situation. Initially, the Cold War dominated, but the curriculum also catered for counterinsurgency operations, Northern Ireland, and after the end of the Cold War, the growth of United Nations operations. The Staff College was teaching the Cold War uh, European warfare but on our television screens every evening in the Wilson and Ante room was the Northern Ireland situation with bricks rattling against Macronon shields and people in tin hats with no scrim on them uh, being beaten about their head by, by Irish crowd. You pick up the Telegraph or the Times just about every day there is an, art, there is an article geared towards defence and the Russian threat to this country and this was not the case in the late 60s uh, when people couldn't understand the reason for having conventional army to fight a nuclear war. And the general consensus was that if there was the next war would just be a bloody great bang, and that would be the end of it. I um, mean, certain days we, we, we seem to be sitting in Germany looking for something that wasn't actually going to happen in case it did happen. But now we've got a job to do, and we are relevant to people. People can relate to what we're doing. Also, as both NATO and the Warsaw Pact, are built round the nuclear superpowers, 
It means that the war that would be fought would have no parallel with any war that had been fought in the past, even the recent past. Would you say if I said that you've produced a, a BOR template and plonked it on the ground here and gone through the motions of arguing about a, an option further back uh, and said, I'm going forward because that's what the template and that's what we're all about. An ideal opportunity to get you to explain to us how you would breach our defences in this area. Well, apart from all the partisan and saboteur operations that would be going on and disrupting in your area, I would start my formal operations by mounting a heli bomb. How you uh, deployed from one line of attack to another was really all that the Staff College did for a bit. Uh, I think there's, they've retrieved that. I, th I think there's now a balance again. The end of the Cold War clearly brought about a, a renaissance of military thinking. For 45 years, uh, military thinking in the British Army had been dominated by the requirements to provide strong defence uh, and deterrence on the northern plains of Europe. Uh, the end of the Cold War meant that the state of the world w had changed dramatically, uh, that the um, requirements and uh, um, commitments of the British Army were going to be much wider spread in the future and therefore it was possible to break the moulds of thinking uh, which had dominated the Staff College as well as the British Army, uh, look at doctrine anew and uh, start from a clean sheet of paper so it was a period of great excitement, great uh, th period of thought uh, and hopefully uh, doctrine was changed as a result of that um, period. The Allenbrook Hall was opened by a field marshal, the Lord Allenbrook, in 1963 and became a focal point for subsequent courses. Allenbrook gave a marvellous talk and told a story and then coming back, taking him to the, to the lunch, I asked him if this story was very true and he said absolutely. The story was that in the old Rawlinson Hall when he was a DS. There was a lecture going on in the afternoon, if you can believe it, on signalling procedures and signalling by a colonel in the signals. And Alan Brooke dozed off and he came to with that awful guilty feeling that everybody was looking at him, so he looked round and all the deers were asleep. And he then looked and he saw everybody was asleep. <laughs> and the only sound was a bee going round. And then he felt so awful for the lecturer and looked at him. And he was leaning on his lectern, fast asleep as well. <laughs> but he saw that was true. But it was a funny time to have a lecture on signaling, wasn't it, in the afternoon? Of course, one of the big changes that did happen was the building of the Allenbrook Hall, which I'm told is falling down now, but um, it was a great step forward because all the activities of the Staff College happened in the Rawlinson Hall, which was the biggest hall that we had where we could all sit down together. And then they built the Allenbrook by the time I came as a DS and that transformed all forms of presentations and entertainments and the pantomime and so on. Because when it was built, it was a very special new piece of equipment. A major feature of the Allenbrook has been the part played by visiting speakers. Whilst keen to speak and to hear the views of the army, it has always been an intimidating auditorium in which to speak. I've heard many other people describe the experience which I would endorse. It's an extremely testing and nerve-wracking experience. I've often heard people say, but experienced politicians and people like that, that it's one of the most testing audiences that you can address. Very well informed, uh, very quick to see the right sort of question to ask, very quick to press it home, very uh, ready to raise a laugh in the audience against the speaker. It's, uh, I, th I think uh, it's, it's easy to do badly at the Allen Brook Hall and very difficult to do well. Despite initial nerves. I've only been in this building once before. 
Ah. You may think there are striking similarities. I came to the Christmas pantomime. <laughs> Most speakers eventually warm to the task. Other people don't believe all they read in the newspapers. I happen to know this isn't true. Um, but we live in hope. <laughs> Indeed, every course is fortunate to hear prominent figures of the time. I do think so that coming back and looking round and find the place is very, very much the same. I think it also goes to show that human nature is still the same. And I have no doubt that now, as in the past and probably in the future, there will be still student officers that do not attend the right lectures at the right time, and this, the Allen Brook gets thinner and thinner on the ground until everybody gets a sudden jolt and we're all back to square one again. But as well as the lectures inside the Allenbrook, syndicate rooms and divisional halls, the students are also given the opportunity to get out into the local area, tuting. These days out will remain in memories for a lifetime. For some, they will be the ultimate reminiscence. I think standing on a hill, arguing about 79 tank division in Odiham, with our Div Colonel slowly realising that we'd all had more pint too many at lunchtime. And this theme continues on the famous battlefield tours, where sometimes the combination of good wine and moving stories from the past can prove a little too much for some. Until 1979, students visited the D-Day beaches and the battlefields of Normandy. It was so wonderful to see the people who had taken part in the D-Day landings from both sides. We were the first year that had um, Colonel von Luck, the German, and there was a certain amount of frisson about it all because it was the first year a German had been asked to come and take part, as it were, an instructor. And he told the story of the breakout of Operation Goodwood. But latterly, students have visited Arnhem, accompanied by veterans of Operation Market Garden. And towards the end of the course, they visit the field of the Somme. While geostrategic issues inevitably influence the atmosphere and shape the curriculum, there are of course other crucial factors, such as the role of the Commandant. The role of the Commandant is an important one in setting the tone and style of the college. It's very much a place that the Commandant dominates in a way that he doesn't dominate sound test. And when I say tone and style, I don't, I don't simply mean uh, by representing the front of house. I think the Commandant does have a very important role to play in um, shaping the course, for example, of the syllabus in the general sense, though I don't think he need necessarily be involved in the detail of that. But the atmosphere, the kind of atmosphere that prevails in any college, depends entirely on the Commandant. So how do the Commandants themselves perceive their role? I think I and the DS tried to make life not too serious. I mean, it was not a school, it's not a university, it's experiencing other people's experiences and learning and reading and so I think we try to feed in a sort of light-hearted atmosphere and um, have a bit of jollity because our great or my great fear was that you could make uh, two people too serious 
they were in dread of the commandant, of course, but no. We had, I think, a, a very happy uh, relationship here. The, um, the directing staff were, in my view, very high quality people. And there was a very friendly, I wouldn't say relaxed attitude, because it certainly wasn't relaxed, because the students knew how important that course was going to be for them. Uh, but as perhaps some of the films made at the time uh, disclose, there was uh, a good deal of cheerful camaraderie about the place as well. I think of the Star College, I think of students talking about the current general a great deal, and they had very strong impressions of him too, and they graded commandants uh, quite as much as commandants graded them. Uh, Kitson, of course, was fascinated. Was, uh, they were fascinated him by him. Uh, there was a fair, he was called Good Morning because that was said that it was all he ever said all year long. Was, uh, except he said Good Morning and aren't oh, any more of those pink biscuits because there was a particular sort of pink wafer at coffee time that he liked very much. Um, cadets, uh, students imitated him a tremendous amount, but they were also very impressed by him because of his extraordinary record as a young officer in uh, what's laughing they call low intensity warfare. Well the role of the commandant of course is not just to act as the headmaster of a school, he's there for all sorts of other reasons, he's there to uh, inspire uh, the young people in the college to try and create a dynamic discussion through which they could advance their own thinking, uh, to try and create the environment in which they did feel able to do that and not to be intimidated, uh, and also to give them a, se a, a sense of uh, faith in what they were doing. And of course, at the end of the day, also to make life fun for them. It no doubt came as a bit of a surprise to students on the course a few years ago to see General Rose finishing so strongly on the Commandant's fun run. Surprising in that at the beginning of the race, he had been seen in a wheelchair, feigning an old parachute injury. Something, of course, the students were unaware of at the time. Ladies and gentlemen! OK, can you hear me? Oh, oh. I shall say, and I'm terribly sorry not to be running with you. That's a race! Are you ready? So the Commandant bestrides the Staff College like a colossus. He sets the tone, he shapes the syllabus. He establishes that unique relationship between the DS and the student, and he tries to make it fun. But of course there is the broader aspect. It's creating that, that atmosphere that I think uh, covers... I'll give you five general areas. It's students want to come, and they want to come back. That's to do with atmosphere. It's creating that atmosphere where directing staff, the very best that the army has to offer, at the stage that they're due to come here as instructors, also want to come, and they don't want to go somewhere else. It's creating an atmosphere within the staff college where speakers, for not very much money, we don't give them big fees as you know, but they want to come and speak. Uh, it's to do with other people who are nothing to do with the Staff College wanting to hear the views of the Staff College uh, on military thinking, on development of operational art and so forth. Uh, and these are many agencies, both nationally and indeed internationally. And again, it's these visitors, the old boys, the old girls, if I could use uh, that aspect as well, who want to just come back with their families from all over the world and just spend three or four hours here, perhaps having lunch. And that together seems to me to summarise the atmosphere. And if you can create that, as I think uh, the Staff College has so very evidently done over the years, then I think you've got the right atmosphere for training tomorrow's people. And the great feature of the Staff College across the years has been the ability to train tomorrow's people against this background where a sense of fun endures and where 
people are able to laugh at each other and themselves. I think this sense of humour and ability to laugh at oneself uh, and the histrionic, the acting, the, the joy dressing up and acting, which is so British, uh, which has given its shape in the pantomime, that atmosphere has not changed uh, in the uh, century and a half or so of the Staff College's life. In 1967, student Michael Mates played a leading role in the review. I, I was involved in putting it together, writing quite a lot of it, producing all of it, and taking part in it. Um, and I think you know, reports are it was quite successful. Okay. If I could have your attention, I would like the taller officers of B Division, that is gentlemen of 5 foot 10 and onwards, to form the fourth row. RSM Slater recalls a story when Dennis Healy, the then Defence Secretary, came to the Allenbrook and was on the receiving end of a very peculiar brand of Scottish humour. And along came a famous gentleman called Eyebrows Healy, who was the head uh, at the Defence for the Labour government, to give a lecture on the Labour government's view on the defence policy. The normal arrangements, uh, I had made sure that the students were in the Allenbrook and then took the Mr Healy and the General in. And the following day it was going to be the Conservatives' view of the defence policy. Just before, after the students were seated, I was going to talk to the general and say, are we ready, sir? He said, you will go in the Allenbrook and tell the gentleman that I do not want another disgusting display of such bad behaviour that happened yesterday in the Allenbrook. And to which I said, well, sir, I do not know of any disgusting display. He said, well, the gentlemen in the front, in the front two rows where the Scottish regiments made their views quite clearly felt by opening their legs quite more than natural <laughs> so that Mr Healy could get a good view of it. You will now go in and do something about it. And I remember saying I was only given a few minutes to think and I said, excuse me sir, may I remind you gentlemen in kilts that the speaker has a very privileged view of the audience and thank you all gentlemen. This must have been well known by all the audience because it received a rousing cheer. <laughs> <laughs> I guess I remember setting fire to an Indian lady sari, okay. and she wasn't very pleased about that. <laughs> Excellent. <laughs> that was on a lady's kiss night. <laughs> yes. Somebody said, you know, why, why, don't, why don't we make a film? And I don't think it would have probably qualified under the Health and Safety at Work Act today. Um, Hawley Lake apparently has some nasty bugs in it, but that's by the by. We chose a marine to drive them send it to the lake and go underwater because we thought, he, well, marines are sort of designed to go underwater. But we had a, a wild sapper uh, who did the sort of battlefield effects and so forth, who laid out all these charges before we shot a scene while this tricycle was coming along and was surrounded by all these wires that he was going to touch on a battery or something. And the first run we did on one occasion, he got it wrong. He let one of these things off, literally under the tricycle, which with our gallant marine on, but literally took off and disappeared into a rhododendron bush in the woods at Minley. Uh, fortunately, of course, being a marine on it, he was totally unharmed, and we, we did it all again. So we had some slip-ups. I might just tell you one story about uh, a very distinguished officer who came here as a student from the Seventh Hazars, and at the end of the course, on which he did very well indeed, he was one of the top students, uh, he had a particularly good party at the end, and this party got pretty out of control, 
and at about three o'clock in the morning, they all went up onto the gallery above the main hall of the Staff College and pulled out the lances which decorate the hall up there. And down in the middle of the hall at the bottom was a beautiful, highly polished dining room table. And they played darts on this with the lances. And when the then commandant came in next morning, he found this table ruined with all the lances stuck in. So this particular student was in dead trouble and he was marched in and he was told that he was very lucky to be allowed to qualify at the Staff College, but the one thing was absolutely certain, he would never, ever come back here again because they were so disgusted at his behaviour. Four years later he was back as a DS and a few years after that he became Commandant. He is now one of my greatest old friends, General Sir Patrick Howard Dobson. Until 1968, C Division students lived at Minley, which produced some travel problems. I do remember uh, being late for an Allenbrook lecture and getting in my car with a couple of people who were whipping me on because we didn't want to embarrass ourselves by getting into the Allenbrook late, and being stopped by a friendly policeman at the top of the hill at Whitewater. Uh, uh, and uh, he said, can I ask what you're doing, sir? And I said, officer, I'm terribly sorry. We are students on the staff course, and we are about to be late. And I'm not sure it wasn't Montgomery coming to talk to us. And it will be a very black mark. He said, all right, sir, I hear you this time. Uh, congratulations, you're the fastest so far this month, he said, but not again. <laughs> Another student film featured a number of the staff including Field Marshal Stanier as Commandant, playing himself. There was a very amusing one made when I was Commandant, uh, in which I come out of it rather badly. Let us not forget the drag, which although it had ceased during the war, continued to play a leading part in the life of the Staff College. Foxhounds is a day, it's a day out, and, and, and you may get a cracking day and chase a fox, or you may get nothing at all. Draghounds, the fun is more concentrated. You know that in really quite a short space of time, you're going to do a lot of jumping, your horse is going to get a lot of, of, of work, you're, you're all going to have a lot of fun, and before you know it, it's over. And, and indeed, a, a day's drag hunting today lasts for perhaps two and a half hours. So it fits beautifully into the pattern that evolved in the British Army in the 30s, 40s and 50s of the Wednesday sports afternoon. A whole series of commandants hunted with the drag. I think General Kitson was the last. Um, and, um, and, and Lady Kitson whipped in, of course. Um, and the hounds uh, in those days uh, met at least once a season at, half, at uh, Staff College House um, where um, they were welcome in spite of uh, the regrettable incident one spring meet where they ate all the daffodils. As well as the drag hunt, the Staff College has always produced teams for other major sports 
especially rugby. And cricket. The annual softball tournament, imported by the American students, has also become a feature. There is even room for some more unusual sports. Uh, and so I'm going to hand over to Simon now, the chief steward, just to introduce you to the official Simon's chief steward. One commentator was moved to write, life would have been a great deal brighter but for the grinding effect of competition. Officers detest competing against one another. It is contradictory to the traditions of the service and stifles the best in the ordinary man while developing the worst in the objectionable. Nevertheless, the black bag process has been a key feature during this period. I used, to, I used to send a vehicle up to uh, the Ministry of Defence uh, on the morning uh, of the, 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 the post in orders and what have you. And um, I think the following day, the students were then given their post in orders and what have you. I think instructions used to close, finish that morning early, and the bar used to open. <laughs> I think, generally speaking, the black bag process does get it right. I think over the past few years, uh, the failure rate has probably been about 1%. Uh, but a great deal of care is taken over it. Um, I think if less care were taken, um, then there might be more mistakes. But it's a, it's a pretty good system. When I was asked for my posting, I sent, uh, sent with it a letter um, saying where it is I wanted to go and what sort of job I wanted to do. And in the letter I said that uh, the one place I didn't want to be sent was to, was to London. But if I was going to be sent to London, then one of the areas I didn't want to work in, because I've been in it for the last two years, was to operational requirements. And they went on to say that if I was sent to operational requirements, the one department I didn't want to go to was to uh, OR10B, because I'd spent my previous two years in Northern Ireland working for that department and didn't want to go. As of yet, I don't know where I'm going, and we're going to find out tomorrow. <laughs> tell from your job pretty well how you done. The jobs, the sport, the humour and the curriculum are crucial, but what really breathes life into the building are the people. It's a people organisation and uh, we must never forget that. Overseas students on the course provide essential variety, both from their different military perspectives and experience, but also from their variety of culture. Probably the most famous ex-Camberley overseas student was Yitzhak Rabin. 
he enjoyed the course, but was sometimes rather pushed to see the relevance of the curriculum. He wrote, for example, I was charged with working out a transportation timetable for an entire division. It was both boring and bizarre into the bargain. And since when did the IDF contain any formation as large as a division? The directing staff are, um, they become role models. Uh, I can remember very clearly all five of the directing staff that I had in, in my year. I can remember them. I remember their views on all sorts of things. And they may not realise it, but one has extracted from their experience and from their, um, their views all sorts of things that you've decided to do or not in, in one's military career. So that's a very, that's a very clear um, a memory for me. Even in 1912, the DS solution, or pink as it is described, has featured in Staff College life. Um, and then the third thing was the, was the um, pa passage of lines. Or, or the, the Likewise, the flow of red ink to correct students' work has endured as a lasting feature. We all sweated away at nights, writing down all these miserable vehicles going down some miserable narrow road. And Nigel Bagnall finished his and handed it in. And it came back with more red ink on it than any exercise I've ever seen before. And it was had written on the corner in red, this is very poor work indeed. And Nigel Bagnall, who's hair was redder in those days than it is today, was so angry he tore it up and threw it in the waste paper basket and said, if that's the sort of thing I've come to learn, I'm going to leave next week. <laughs> uh, he didn't, of course. Commandants, directing staff and students over the years will always remember with gratitude the essential part played the civilian staff. I came here um, the day of the Kermit Roosevelt lecture, which was May, May the 4th, I think, in 1954, and um, I did 34 years of unbroken service. And uh, there are people here today who were here when I was a student, and I think that says an awful lot about a place. Despite the variety that life at the Staff College offers, and in spite of its rich history, this august institution is a place that often leaves students on the course ambivalent about the impression it has left on them. It's, um, it's like a venerable and dusty old public school. I'd describe it as a bit of a, a roller coaster, lots of highs, punctuated probably by a few more lows. Uh, with the students all the time getting thrown from one corner to the next. Um, a feeling that um, um, the year I spent with South College has been like part of a, a truculent sixth form with a few high achievers. I think at times it's totally frenetic and at other times it certainly appears to be pretty calm. But by and large I think we're mostly, all of us like the proverbial duck, calm on the surface and paddling like fuck underneath. <laughs> I think rather like the Church of England, the Staff College is not what it seems. Um, we are a truly Gemeinschaft society. There is nobody here I can say is either truly selfish or truly generous. Um, and that's, that's about what I think of the Staff College. I would say it's a relaxed centre of excellence that's at ease with itself and what it does. But perhaps, like those venerable and dusty old public schools, it is only with the passing of time that one really appreciates a place that may have troubled one whilst in the day. Uh, my enduring memories are of a year that stretched me, but did so in remarkably good company because the company was professional uh, but it was also good company in the sense that it was fun. Well I've uh, 
very good and nice memory from the staff college. I'm remembering almost all along the time that I have been here. I enjoyed that very much. It was very useful for me and for my family. And maybe it was one of the best years that I had in, in my life. It was a hugely enjoyable year. It had its ups and downs. It had its moments, like all life does. I enjoyed it. I enjoyed it as much as any other part of my military career. As the Staff College prepares to close, it is not only a time to cast one's eye over the past, but also to look towards the future. The demise of the Army Staff College, and indeed the future of staff training, is both divisive and emotive. To be quite honest, I'm devastated. I never thought that it could happen. I'm terribly, terribly disappointed and ashamed that my country would ever do this. I think there's a centre of excellence here with a sense of history for the British Army going back 150 years and in splitting it up you cannot ever recreate it again. Well, I don't think I'm alone in saying I think it's a grave disappointment. It's a lovely idea, but uh, as we all know there will be so many exceptions to jointery within the joint syllabus that uh, I wonder how much of the time these students will feel that they're actually receiving joint service training. I think there'll be a lot of specialised fleet staff work, there'll be a lot of specialised air power staff work, and there will be a lot of specialised ground battlefield staff work. Now, if your uh, learning is now going to be uh, mixed up with a lot of stuff about the Air Force and the Navy, I think it's too early in your career. I mean, everybody's going joint now. It is inevitable. And they will learn how joint staffs operate, and that will be very good. Um, some of the single service attitudes will rub off on each other so that they will know how sailors or airmen or soldiers tend to think when presented with a given situation. So it is inevitable, and it is right. Awful as it is for an old buffer to say so, that we lose that wonderful esprit that we had. And that's it. Like the regimental system, it's like everything else. I, I am sad and slightly surprised that all this has been thrown up in the air and there's no permanent uh, home decided yet. I just wonder what sort of uh, staff college critique that would have had if we had been presented with a syndicate challenge and we'd come up and found we were all packing our bags and moving into porter cabins or whatever but uh, uh, nobody quite knew where we were going to go at the end but uh, maybe I shouldn't be saying that on a film like this. On December the 14th 1859 on a bitterly cold afternoon, His Royal Highness the Duke of Cambridge departed from a visit to the Royal Military College Sandhurst. Before reaching the road to London, he turned left up onto the raised ground to the site for the building of the new Staff College. Waiting for His Royal Highness was the Commandant, Lieutenant Colonel MacDougall. After a short welcoming speech, His Royal Highness was invited to lay the foundation stone of the new building. So far, only the brickwork of the foundations had been laid. The stone had been prepared but was not an exact fit, so His Royal Highness, on advice from Mr. Meyer the Builder, used a hammer and chisel to ensure a satisfactory location. In a prepared recess in the stone, His Royal Highness placed a small mahogany box containing a description of the events of the day and a set of coins. Curiously, the stone was never marked. The original plans failed to mark its location and despite extensive underground exploration within the bowels of the building, it remains undiscovered. Some mysteries are never meant to be solved.